Well, we're going to talk this morning about live what you love. Live what you love. What does that mean? Uh, and I was kind of thinking about this during the week, and let me just kind of uh, give a, a, a caveat before I start. I'm preaching to myself, first and foremost. This is a message that God has just kind of drilled me with uh, this week. Just a kind of a little bit of a, a kind of a, an insight into my own life. These probably last 10 to 12 months have probably been the driest spiritually for me that I have ever known. Uh, you may, I know all of us go through that, but for me, literally for almost a year now, I have just struggled to connect with God, to read my Bible, to pray. I get up every morning, I have my quiet time, and some mornings, man, it just feels like I am trying to get blood out of a storm. It really does. So I just want you to let you know that I'm not perfect, I struggle. Uh, this has been a tough year for me, but I feel that God is, you know, have, have you ever seen kind of ground that's baked hard, dry? It's as dry as you could possibly, it's cracked. That's what my life has felt like this last year. But it feels like the water's starting to flow a little bit. And it's kind of come through the revelation of this word, so I'm hoping it will do the same for you this morning. Uh, I, I was kind of reading a, a survey online of 3,000 people in the US, just ordinary people, not Christians, just a general population, 3,000. And they were asked, what are the top 10 most important things that you would consider for your life? What are the top 10 things? And this is the top nine. And here we go, just to kind of save you guessing. So parents, you know, parents are pretty important. It's good to have our parents around. Even when we're older, it's still nice to have parents around. Knowledge and happiness. I mean, who doesn't want to be happy? Anybody here want to be happy? Oh, that's about three more than the first crowd. It's like, wow, okay. I thought everybody wanted to be happy, but hey, you know, that's just me. Food and drink. Who thinks food and drink's important? Yeah, absolutely. I think food and drink's important. Uh, friends. We like friends. Health is good. Anybody want to be healthy? Yeah, absolutely. Music. Yeah, I can give or take music. It's good. It's, yeah, whatever. Uh, family. Family's important. Love. We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We want somebody to love. We want to be involved. But what is the obvious one that's missing? Money? Who said money? Money is missing, but actually it wasn't number one, it was number 12. What is number one? This is not a Christian survey, and yet everybody said that God was, not everybody, but the most important was God. And yet we seem surprised. <laughs> wow, 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 really, wow. It's so true. In fact, you can get rid of the other nine because the other nine are not important at all, really, compared to God. I'm not saying they're not important. We need family and we need love and we need food and drink. Yeah, absolutely. But inside of God, inside of a relationship with God or even outside of a relationship with God, every single one of those is affected. Whether we love God or whether we don't, whether in a relationship with God or not, every single one of those is affected by that one thing. How much is God a part of our life? So I'm going to ask you some questions, and I don't want kind of like everybody shouting up because you might wish you hadn't by the time we've finished. But I'm going to ask you, are you happy with your life? Is it what you thought it would be? For those of you who are a little bit further on in years, think back to when you were 16, 17, and all those grand delusions that you had of what life was going to be. And you realize now that they were delusional. Did you think you'd be married by now? Did you think you'd still be married by now? Were you expecting to be, to be divorced by now? Did you expect to have kids? Did you expect to be raising those kids by yourself? What kind of job did you expect you would have? Do you still have the job that you want? Did you ever get the job that you wanted? Did you, do you still think that the job that you wanted is all that it was cracked up to be? Or that any other job in the world would be better than the job that you have right now? Have you ever dreamt about how life could be different, might be different? What if you lived somewhere else? What if you lived closer to home or further away from home? What if you had more money? What if you had less money? It's amazing how many of us think life could be so much more different. Uh, one of my favorite kind of Christmas movies is a movie called The Family Man. 
uh, with Nicolas Cage in it. If you've never watched it, it's a, it's a good movie to watch. Uh, he's a kind of a very successful businessman. He's single. He can have any woman he wants. He's got all the money he could need. He drives a, a really nice Ferrari. Life is going really well for this guy. And some chance encounter with a stranger, uh, he ends up having a glimpse of another life, a life where he'd stayed with his girlfriend uh, when he was younger, and they'd just got married, and she ended up being a, a pro bono lawyer, and he ended up being in a dead-end job as a salesman for tires. They had two kids living in suburbia, very little money, but life was actually pretty good. He never expected that life could be better than what he had, and yet the answer when we all ask, is there something better to life than this? The answer is, Yes, absolutely. There is always something better than what we've got right now. And that's not to make us discontent, but in a sense it should. Because if we're living for anything other than a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, we are missing out on something. There isn't a job in this world, or a spouse in this world, or amount of money in this world that will ever satisfy more than God. Because the trouble is with everything on this list except God, it involves somebody or something else that we have no control over. All of these rely on somebody or something else that we either have or don't have. Anybody ever been a parent? Yeah? Anybody ever been a child? Anybody ever been a 100% obedient child? No, I didn't think so. There's not many of us around. <clears throat> As long as there are people in our life, we will have trouble and uncertainty. Get used to it. As long as you're chasing stuff and money and possessions, you will always have frustration and disappointment. Get used to it. As long as you're trying to find happiness in other people, in relationships, in sex, in drinking, in drugs, in thrill-seeking, or whatever else outside of Christ, you will be left feeling empty. Get used to it. It's a happy message, isn't it? Life sucks at times. It really does. How many of us, though, are always trying to write a better story for ourselves? How many of us, I remember a few, I don't know, about a month ago or something, apparently there was a big lottery win in the States. I don't know how much it was, but it was some stupid amount of money. How many of us, when we hear those figures, oh, if I just won that, my life would be so much different. Yeah, for a little while it would. But it wouldn't solve any of your problems. Because the only thing that can ever make our lives better is God. The only person that can write a better story for us is God himself. He is the most satisfying thing that we can ever have. And yet we look to so many other things. And I'm preaching to the choir, I know I am. This is nothing new. I'm not trying to teach grandma to suck eggs, it's just... It's life. We know this stuff. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means you already know this. Grandma knows how to suck eggs. Well, they can in Britain. You should go there. <laughs> right off track now. But the one thing that we, that we know, we know, we know, we know that God is the most satisfying thing. I'm not teaching you something you don't know. We already know this. If we've become Christians, if we've given our life to Christ, we know in our heads that nothing in this world will ever satisfy us more than God. And yet how often we still try to make the things of this world satisfy us. We keep trying to fill this God-shaped hole, which is actually our whole existence. It's not just a little part of us. It's our whole life needs to be filled with God, and yet we try to fill it with almost everything else but God. We need to get it once and for all. Jesus really is all that we need. And so this whole message about live what you love is about finding Jesus to be all sufficient. What does it mean for Jesus to be all sufficient? To be the one that actually makes the difference. Dave, do you want to click that slide on? What does it mean for Jesus to be all sufficient? And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 63. This is where we're going to spend a bit of time this morning. It's one of David's psalms. There's a lot of them are. Not all of them, but most of them. 
And it says this, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I mean, just great imagery. It's that, it's that hard-baked ground, no water for so long. I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. I mean, David is in a good place. He is longing for God. Your love is better than life, is what he cries out. And yet, in reality, David is probably at the lowest point in his entire life. Doesn't sound like it, but he is. The background to this psalm is actually that David has fled his throne. He's left all of his possessions. He's left his kingdom. He's left his, he's left his wives. His own son is actually trying to kill him so that he can become king. And yet David isn't seeking for any of those things to fill the vacuum in his, in his life. Where he finds himself, he's actually in the desert. He's fled from everything he knows. He's fled for his life, basically. And yet David isn't saying, oh, if only I got my palace back. If only I had all my riches again. If only I had all my wives again. Not one of those does he seek. If only my son would stop trying to kill me, life would be better. Well, I'm sure it would be. But he doesn't even pray for any of that. How does he begin? I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. He's after God because he knows that only God can truly satisfy. That getting all of those things back won't make the slightest bit of difference if God is not the very center of his life. What are you wishing for to be different in your life right now? If you could change one thing, if there's one thing that you think if that would change, then life would be, more, would be better than it is now. Because if it's not for an increasingly deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, you are wasting your time. Sorry to burst that bubble. There are things in your life that can make it better, absolutely, and they're not wrong to seek after. That's not what this message is about, but to seek before Christ is because it will always let us down it will always leave us disappointed and disillusioned Jesus is everything if we want to live what we love we need to learn to love Jesus more than anything we've got to learn to love Jesus we know it we know that we're supposed to but for some reason we don't we try and we know that the Bible is, is true, it's God's word, God doesn't lie, and yet we don't live in the reality of it so often. And I'm exactly the same. I'm no different. I struggle as much as anybody. But we can't stop longing for Jesus. If our deepest desire and hunger and longing and aching isn't for Jesus, we're heading in the wrong direction. We're trying to grab hold of a mist you can't do it. Have you ever tried to hold a cloud? You can't do it. Try and get hold of the fog. It's a waste of time. You know it's there, but you'll never get hold of it. The only thing that's tangible in our life is Jesus Christ. And we don't need to look everywhere and anywhere for it. We just need to run to him. We need to grasp it like David grasped it. That the only thing that can satisfy us, no matter what we're facing in life, is Jesus Christ. That's when the rubber hits the road. And I can guarantee that if you're chasing after a job or something like that that you think will fulfill your life, you're wasting your time because I've done it. I have got to the point in every single job that I've ever had 
where I've thought, nah, this just doesn't do it anymore. Nah, it just doesn't excite me anymore. This is not what I thought I was doing. When I was 16, I would have never told you that I would have ended up as a pastor in Canada, in Saskatchewan, in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of winter, because God knows I hate the cold. I was born in Australia. There's something in me that thinks I should be by the beach. It's in me. It's in my blood. Why bring me to Canada? The seminaries in Florida, California. There's people there that need to hear about Jesus. But I would have never said when I was 16 that I would be here. No idea whatsoever. And I almost entitled this sermon, Loving the Life You Never Wanted. Does that kind of ring a bell? Love the life you never wanted. Because for many of us, this is not the life that we dreamed of when we were younger. It just isn't. It's just life. And that is life. It's just life. We get on with it. We do what we do. But I wonder how many of us have prayed this prayer. God, what is it that you're calling me to? Here's another way of putting it. God, what's your will for my life? Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Yeah, I have. I don't know how many times. Do you know there's an answer to it? Did you know that? Does anybody know what the answer is to it? To love God. What's the greatest commandment in the Bible? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, put all of your energy into knowing Jesus Christ. If you're doing anything other than that, you're actually disobeying God. Because it's a commandment. <laughs> Do this. But the, it's a commandment that comes with an infinite blessing. Because when we actually do it, when we get it, and we actually learn to seek God more than anything else, everything else falls into place. It doesn't mean that he ever promises a trouble-free life. He doesn't. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. But I am with you. That's the promise. You will never go through it on your own when we seek Christ first. Just think about Joseph uh, for a minute. Very popular character in the Bible. You know, in Genesis 37 to 45, we kind of get a synopsis of Joseph's life. Starts off when he's young, quite young, maybe in his early teens at best. And he gets this sense that God's given him dreams. You know, that his mother and father and his brothers are going to bow down before him. And they love him for it. Not. If you've read it, if not, read it. They hate him. His brothers detest him. Can't stand him. He's Joseph, the favorite. Daddy's little favorite blue-eyed boy. Can't do anything wrong. They can't stand him. And eventually, they plot to kill him, but they can't go through with that, so they sell him into slavery. Something we don't really know anything about. None of us have been sold into slavery as far as I know. But for somebody like Joseph, that was it. That was his life from now on. He would be a slave. No way of getting out of it. His life was a slave. Doesn't matter about his background. Doesn't matter who his dad is now. He's a slave for the rest of his life. I can't imagine that when he got those dreams from God, that this is how he saw it unfolding. I'm pretty sure he had delusions of grandeur as well about what his life was going to look like. Because for somebody who has people bowing down before them, generally doesn't begin with slavery. It generally means that they're born into something much bigger than what he has right now. But eventually he ends up in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard, and he serves him well, and, and he has favor, but all of a sudden, Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph. But Joseph does the right thing and runs away, and she wrongfully accuses him. And what happens? Yeah, gets thrown into prison. Well, people are not going to serve him in prison either. There's nobody going to be bowing down to Joseph in prison. And again, as far as we know, Joseph isn't crying out, what's your will for my life, God? Because I'm pretty sure if this was it, I'd rather not know it. This is not what I was expecting to happen from these dreams that you gave me. And again, as far as Joseph knows, that's it. He'll die in prison. It's not the kind of prison where they educate you and pay you to do the laundry. 
As far as he knows, he will die there, and he could die there pretty soon. Because there's not really anybody going to be feeding him or looking after him. But then eventually, Joseph becomes a second in charge of a country, of a nation that's not even his own, of a people that he doesn't even belong to. How does that happen? Well, in Genesis 39, it says this, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all he did to succeed in his hands. And then further on in chapter 39, The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He's now in prison. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. This is Joseph. And then Joseph eventually comes before Pharaoh. One of the guys that he was in prison with eventually gets restored back to Pharaoh's service. And Pharaoh's struggling. He's had these dreams and nobody can tell him what they're what they mean, and then this guy remembers, well, Joseph told me my dream, so it's worth a try, Pharaoh, why don't you get this guy? And, and, and can you imagine, all of a sudden, Joseph is now before the guy, the man? I don't know about you, but I'd feel pretty good. This is my chance. I'll tell Pharaoh what his dream means. I'll get out of prison. At least I might get out of prison. And what does Joseph do? He comes before Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, you can interpret my dreams. And what does Joseph say? No, I can't. But God can. I can't do it. But God can. I mean, he's just kind of blown his whole chance of being the boy. Being, this is his get out of jail free card. If I can impress Pharaoh, but as far as Joseph knows, he's going to help Pharaoh and he'll go straight back to prison. There are no guarantees. But he tells Pharaoh, God will help you. I can't. Joseph understands the correlation between him and his relationship with God. He understands that there's nothing in him that he can give to Pharaoh at all. He's not crying out for God's will for his life. He's just believing that whatever is happening, God is with him in it. Because whatever he does, God makes him successful. Not himself, it's not anything of him. Even when his brothers come to him, at the end when he's gone through this whole charade and and trying to figure out are they really changed guys? Are they still the same brothers that sold him into slavery? This is what he says to them in Genesis 45, verse 5. Don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourself for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here. It was God who sent me here. But he's not bitter. He's not angry at God. He's not waving his fist at God saying, how dare you? You told me that people were going to serve me. Oh. All of a sudden, people are bowing down to him. You know, but I, I can't believe that Joseph is actually as good as he is. I mean, it just makes me a little bit sick. I was like, he really is a goody two-shoes. I'm like, seriously? He must have known something we didn't know. He must have had a Bible is all I can think. He must have had a Bible. Because he must have read Paul's letter to the Roman church. He must have. Because this is what it says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Not mine. The will of God is that you do his purpose and that you do it by loving him more than anything else. So Joseph must have read it because how could he possibly know that God is working for his good? Because we've got the Bible and we know that, don't we? Don't we? Don't we? We do have a Bible and we do read it every day. Maybe, maybe we should. But you know what? Joseph didn't have a Bible. He didn't have any scripture at all. There was nothing in existence. And yet he knew that God was at work 
in and through all of this. He had no idea how it was going to unfold. And the trouble is, you know, we, we think that we're, we're, we're giving people pat answers when we quote verses like Romans 8, 28. But if we really believe it, it's not a pat answer. It really isn't. I listened to this a message by John Piper this week and he was saying this. It's like, why do we think that saying Romans 28 to somebody who's going through an incredibly difficult time is a pat answer? It can't be anything but a pat answer if we really believe it. Because no matter what we face, God is working it together for our good because we're living for his purposes. It's when we start living for our own purposes that things go AWOL and things go messed up. Let me read you this quote from a pastor, a Baptist pastor in the States. For thousands of years, the Bible has been adequate to equip the saints to go through unspeakable tragedy, to face persecution and even martyrdom. Our problem today is not that the Bible isn't capable of dealing with our problems, but rather we do not know the vast resources that God has put there for us. We come to know Christ when he opens our eyes to see his glory and excellence at the cross. At that point, we begin a lifelong quest to know him more deeply. It's Paul crying out in Philippians 3, I want to know Christ. That growing personal knowledge of Christ is as our all in all supplies us with all that we need for life and godliness. That's the truth. Jesus really is all that we need. Am I wrong? Is there anybody here that thinks that's wrong? But, but do we believe it? Do we believe it the way that we should believe it? Because I don't all the time. I know it. But it doesn't always make the connection in my life. These are not pat answers. They are life-giving, hope-giving, joy-giving words from the very God of the universe himself to each one of us. Do you get that? These are not pat answers. They are not just things to quote off the top of our head because we don't know what to say. They are things to say because we know what to say. Because we know that the God who wrote them is true and faithful and will do whatever he said he would. What has God called you to do? To love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. If you devote your life to doing that, the rest will fall into place. It really will. Doesn't matter what you walk through, God will be with you. We're called to be with God. Pastor Dan often says, We're not human doings, we're human beings. We're meant to be with God. When God created Adam and Eve, He wanted them to be with Him. He gave them work to do, sure, but that wasn't the purpose they were created for. They were created to be with God. A job will never satisfy you. Your career will never fulfill you. A husband or wife will not complete you. If you haven't seen Jerry Maguire. More money will not solve your problems. Better health will not make your day better. Stop worrying about where you'd live or how to make more money or what career to choose or who you'll marry. Will you ever marry? Where should you live? What car should you drive? They're all irrelevant if we're not focusing on Jesus Christ first. Love Jesus and do like David did. Seek him, thirst after him, long for him. This whole psalm centers on God and who he is. Everything about it is about God and it should be for us as well. I love this quote by John Piper. Just listen to this and let it sink in. When we have little and have lost much, Christ comes in and reveals himself as more valuable than what we've lost. And when we have much and are overflowing in abundance, Christ comes and shows he is far superior to everything we have. So whether you've got nothing or whether you've got everything, it doesn't make any difference if you don't have Christ. And John MacArthur says this, to seek something more than what we have been given in Christ is like frantically knocking on a door, seeking what's inside and not realizing that you hold the key in your pocket. We're constantly crying out, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I want you to know me. That's all I want. I want you to love me. I want you to understand what it means to walk with me every single day of your life. 
This top 10 list that we had at the beginning is so right. God is number one. There's only one thing on the list. It's God. Everything else will flow out of our relationship with God. If everything, even when we think of Job, think of Job in the Bible. Probably one of the earliest books written. Think about when his life just got stripped away from him. Literally everything, everything he owned, stolen, his family killed, even his own health, just about gone. The only thing that God said to Satan he couldn't do was to kill him. But he pretty much took him to the point of death. And yet at the end of it, Job sees it's all about God. It's all about him. So whatever's happening at home, run to Jesus. Whatever's happening at work, run to Jesus. Whatever's happening in your finances, run to Jesus. Whatever's happening in your marriage, and your relationships, run to Jesus. Whatever is lacking in your life, run to Jesus. He's the only one that can ever make the difference. And one of the, the amazing things that, that, that kind of came out and really struck me when I was listening to this sermon by John Piper this week, He's talking about persecution and suffering uh, as Christians. And he said, one of the things that we, we will miss is that we don't rejoice in Christ in the trials of life now. So we won't rejoice fully in him when we actually get to heaven. And I, it really struck me. I thought, what? Shoot, of course we will. But he said, we won't realize the full impact of it because we haven't understood what it means to rejoice in Christ when things are really tough. So why will we think that we'll get it all of a sudden when things are really great? He said, we rejoice in Christ now, then we'll really get it then. I don't want to be one of those that misses that. I don't want to be one of those that misses out on what it really means to rejoice in Christ because we were born again and brought into eternal life the minute we surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. It's not a future thing. It's a now and future thing. Eternal life begins the minute you surrender your life to Christ. Do we live in the reality of that? Ephesians 1 says that we are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. doesn't mean then. It means now. We need to live in the reality of that. What does that mean? Do we search the word of God? Do we know the resources? It says that God supplies all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What are those glorious riches? Do you search scripture to find them? Do we really fully know what it means to rejoice in Christ now? We need that continuity in our lives. It's not something that's then. It's meant to be lived and experienced right now. The reality that Jesus is everything. You know, I, I've read books. I mean, has anybody ever read the book, The Heavenly Man? If you haven't, read it. It puts our nominal Christian Western Christianity in a, just a, a whole different light. I mean, what it means to really follow Jesus. You know, I mean, in prison, having his legs broken so that he can't escape because, just because he loves Jesus, because he preaches Jesus. There's probably very few of us will ever go through something like that. But what if everything was stripped away? What if Jesus was all literally we had left apart from the clothes on our back? What would he mean to us then? I don't want this to be a heavy message. I, I really don't. I think it's a, God wants to inspire us to think, wow, what am I missing? Why do I keep chasing after fruitless things that will never satisfy me? When every day I get to spend with Jesus, I can really be with Jesus. And I'm just going to draw two quick things out of this, this verse that we've got. Um, in Psalm 63, verse 3. It says this, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. What, what does that mean? How can David say that? Despite what he's going through, despite being in the worst possible place in his life, he can say, your love is better than life. What does that mean? Sounds like a great thing to say, but I don't know what it means. I don't get it. How can you say that? I think there's two things, two things that I see. I think the first thing is that he understands that he's loved by God. He's loved by God. 
the, I think the three most powerful words in the entire universe are this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God, the supreme being in all of creation, who keeps everything spinning just because he says so, that this universe is exactly the same as when he created it because he said so, that we're the exact distance from the sun that we don't burn up or freeze to death because he said so, loves you. God likes you. God wants to be with you. God wants to spend time with you. Does that make any difference? It should. Romans 8 verses 35 to 39. Jessica read some of this this morning. Just a powerful, powerful scripture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Most of which none of us have ever faced. For your sake we face death all day long. We're considered sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, I don't think he left anything out, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate, you can't separate yourself from God. God will not stop loving you even if you do stop loving him. Because he can't. 1 John, verse, 1 John 3 tells us God is love. He can't do anything else but love you because he set his heart to do so. John 3.16 For God so loved you, that he gave his one and only son. But if you believe in him, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life beginning now. Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were stinking, filthy, no good, rotten, not desiring God in any shape, way or form, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Don't mistake. Don't forget that God loves you. And the second thing I think this, in this, that David understands that he's loved by God, but he gets to love God. Love, love for God will just cause the things in our life to just fizzle away. It really will. Do, do, do you remember what it was when you had your first love? Some of you will have to think back pretty hard. A few decades ago, a few eons ago, do you remember what it felt like, that first crush, when you just longed to be able to see them from the other side of the room, just get a glimpse of that person? I'm in the same room as them. I can't think, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can barely breathe. Till I see them again. Do you remember that? Because that's what it's meant to feel like when we hear the name Jesus. That's what it should conjure up. That's what should overwhelm us. That the finding the sweetness of his supremacy to be all pervading in our life. That he is the lover of my soul and the one that my soul delights in. Do you remember the, the, the movie The Lion King? The, and the hyenas are all around talking about Mufasa. Ooh. And they literally shiver. You know, that's the, that's the king, Mufasa. Ooh. That's what it's meant to be like when we say Jesus. Ooh. Jesus. Ooh. He loves me. 
Jesus loves me. I mean, we should be going around and getting people by the throat and saying, do you know Jesus loves me? Can you believe that Jesus loves me? Seriously, do we get it? I mean, that's what we should be. We should be the most love-crazed people on the planet because God loves me. God loves you. Does that not, there's Mark Harvey aren't even smiling. I, I just, you know, how can we go through life knowing that the Jesus loves us and we like, oh, what a rough day to do. Really? You were threatened by the sword? You've been through famine? Really? In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus is writing to the seven churches in Asia. And he's writing to the Ephesian church. And he's got lots to say about them. But he says, I have this one thing I hold against you. You've forgotten your first love. Just one thing. But it's the most important thing. You've forgotten to love me. You've forgotten to be so in love with me every single day that it changes your life. I asked Jessica if we could sing that song this morning in Christ alone, and I just want to read the first verse again. And just, I want you to just close your eyes and think about these words and how, how true are they actually in our lives. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Really? He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, this rock solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Here, right where I know that I am loved by God himself, I stand firm. That I cannot be shaken because I stand in the love of Christ, loved by him and full of love for him. We want to live what we love, then we need to love Jesus. If we live what we love and we love Jesus, then no matter what our life is, we can love it because our life is Jesus. Do you get that? If we live what we love and we truly love Jesus more than anything else, then no matter what our life is, we can love it because we love Jesus. We can love Jesus. Live what you love. Learn to love Jesus more than anything. Let's stand. We're going to pray.